Trapmore gang, welcome back to another video and today we're going to be looking at a very classic hip hop case. The Wave God himself, Max B. Now you may be familiar with his name frequently being shouted out by long term day one homie French Montana, ha! Huh? Or you may know him from his age old feud with fellow New York rap legend Jim Jones. And you may well know that he to this day is still incarcerated as the result of a criminal case that ended up landing him a whopping 75 year sentence for a crime he wasn't even at the seen of. Now I must admit I am very aware of Max B's impact and legacy in the hip hop scene but I am not super clued up on the case that took him off of the streets and away from music fans for a whopping number of years. So today we together as a group as the Trap More Legion we're going to take a look at some documents, at some assets, some clips and try and understand what really happened in the Max B case. So first off just as a little bit of background I found this very helpful guide to Max B over on Hip Hop Heads on Reddit. So let's have a quick look through this. Charlie Wingate, better known as Max Bigavelli, a mix of Biggie, Jigger and Machiavelli, the Boss Don, the Silver Surfer or simply The Wave is a rapper from Harlem who rose to prominence in the New York City underground in the mid to late 2000s. Fresh off a prison sentence in 2005, Max began making waves, you get it, by linking up with Jim Jones and Bird Gang with an immediately recognisable voice that almost turned into R&B style crooning at times and an unbelievable sense of melody and hook writing. He stole the the show from his dipset compatriots with an alarming regularity. Unfortunately for Max, his partnership with New York's premier underground collective would soon turn sour after receiving no songwriting royalties for the features and hooks he contributed to Jim Jones' Hustlers poem record, including the smash hit We Fly High. We fly high, no lie, you know this, bowling. I hope those are the correct lyrics, but I just remember that from Def Jam Icon, and that was a classic Jim Jones banger. Apparently, Max Beat was paid an average of $300 for live shows. He split up with Jim Jones and then released an incredible string of material in 2007 and 2008 that can best be summed up as fuck Jim Jones. Savage. Despite being at his creative peak, all was not well in the world of the wave. His days were secretly numbered after a robbery attempt in 2006 that went wrong and ended in a murder. Max was implicated as the leader of the operation by his girlfriend and an associate. The sentencing finally came down in 2009 with a verdict of 75 years in prison. Many people People felt the sentencing was disproportionate compared to Max's actual involvement in the crime and that he was unfairly judged due to his profession as a rapper. Now you know why people post free Max B stuff all over the place, but enough about the man, let's get into the music. Now if you want to go and check this out on our hip hop heads, The Guide to Max B by user Robotic Paradox, go check it out, you can tuck into some of the best Max B contributed, written, performed, all that good stuff over here. I can't play you any of the songs due to copyright, but you can soak those gems up in your own time. Of course what we're really interested in is the grisly details of the case that put Max B behind bars. So let's jump on over to Wikipedia and just take a little bit of a look at some background info before we get into some clips and some court documents. So over here on Wikipedia, under felony murder charges, it says, according to the authorities, Max sent his ex-girlfriend Gina Conway and his stepbrother Kevin Leardam in 2006 to rob two men in a Holiday Inn in Fort Lee, Northern New Jersey. On September the 22nd, 2006, Conway and Leardam ambushed Alan J. Plowden in room 408 and restrained him with duct tape while awaiting Plowden partner David Taylor. Also in the room was Giselle Neva. When Taylor arrived he was immediately shot point blank execution style in the head and he didn't even have any money on him. From here the crew fled the scene. Plowden then alerted the hotel front desk of the murder as police entered the room. Plowden was caught moving $30,000 out of the room and Plowden was later charged with money laundering and identity theft. One week later Conway, Leardam and coordinator Max B were apprehended and charged. On January the 9th 2007 Max Max B was remanded to Bergen County Jail in New Jersey on a $2 million bail. Now I could only find one news clip that pertained to this case and unfortunately whoever decided to re-upload this clip to YouTube put some terribly balanced music underneath it so this is going to sound like straight dookie but let's just take a little look at this news clip surrounding the Max B case so we can have a better understanding of what shit really looked like when it was going down. Authorities in Bergen County say they solved the murder at a hotel in Fort Lee. A man was shot to death. It's a tale of money laundering, prostitution and two separate robberies plans. So apparently there were two separate robbery plans as part of this and even prostitution played a role. I've got to say we are really delving into the dark murky underworld of the New Jersey crime world here. Okay so I, I don't know much anything about this other than Max B being the, the wavy god of the waves and French Montana's homie. There ain't no French Montana without Max B it seems. So A total of nine people are under arrest today. Now this case involves two separate groups of people each with their eye on $30,000. So it was two separate groups of people and 
nine people ended up getting picked up and everybody was just trying to get their hands on $30,000, I guess, just in cash that one of the targets was known to walk around with. These are two Wild Wild West groups that are operating independently. And poor Mr. Taylor uh, um, suffered at least by something that was obviously completely unnecessary. So they said this is some Wild Wild West shit. Okay. Two competing groups are basically trying to get their hands on a $30,000 bag and they don't care who they've got to kill to get it. It's crazy. We do know that uh, they carried a lot of cash. Uh, they flashed a lot of cash. They did live the high life uh, coming up here to uh, New Jersey. From what I understand, the guys that were the targets were basically like, you know, some local hustlers and they had their fingers in a few pies, but unfortunately weren't moving low key enough to keep their activity secret. Eventually, it seemed like a whole bunch of people got wind of the sorts of bags that they were running around with and decided to knock it over. At the time of the shooting, both Plowden and Taylor each had a prostitute with them, Mike Castro and Giselle Nieves. Damn, they each had a prostitute with them. You know you're balling when you get your own prostitute. Ain't no sharing going on around here. The women were introduced to them by a third man, Julio Cruz. It's Cruz who hatches a plan, along with his friend Edward Blancano, to rob Plowden and Taylor. They asked Ms. Ms. Nieves and Ms. Castro to quote, soften them up as we use the phrase uh, to, to make them loose and to let their guard down which would allow them to uh, to be robbed easily. Meantime, another group of people had the same idea. Let's break this down for a second, okay? We well, got the two targets, they're getting loosened up by a couple of working girls, okay? Meanwhile, a couple of dudes have hatched a plan to come and knock the bag over whilst they're getting worked by these two girls. But meanwhile, another crew have got wise to this whole thing and they're gonna come in and, oh man, this is, Whew, whew. Just imagine being in that situation. That is not a good look. It began when this woman, Gina Marie Conway, a prostitute who'd been with Plowden, told her boyfriend, Charlie Wingate, a.k.a. Max V, a rapper, about the men's money. Okay, we got three working girls. They've all got wise to these ballers that have got a bag at the Holiday Inn of all places. I, 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 this ain't the sort of high-end Holiday Inn shenanigans that I thought we'd be getting if Chingy's music is anything to go by. It was Chingy that made that song, right? That was indeed Chingy. Then Wingate reaches out to this man, Calvin Leardom. So, according to the news report, at least, we're going to get into the court documents next, but Max B, his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend, it depends, it's been put across both ways. Let's just say for the sake of this that his ex-girlfriend was also a working girl, knew about the whole thing from these other two working girls. Now look, I am no user of Ladies of the Night, but having watched this, I tell you what, it sounds like the ultimate setup. I think you're just better off sticking to the good old-fashioned knuckle shuffle and just keeping it moving if you're at the Holiday Inn, frankly. You know what I mean? You'd probably get some adult films. You know what I mean? Go get Adam 22's OnlyFans if, if you're that desperate. After Mr. Taylor was shot, Learden and Conway took the valuables, the valuables on him, some $800 along with the Rolex and some other items. They never found the $30,000. That money was hidden in the hotel room, but it was found by the Burton County prosecutor. No. So after all of that, nobody even got the $30,000 and the prosecutors ended up finding it. So the entire thing was an L. Sweet Jeebus, okay? Now that was a slightly scrappy news report. That was before the case had actually taken place. And before we get into the court papers and break down some of the info about actually what was going on, according to the prosecutors, there's also a bunch of footage floating around of Max B in court or going to court, getting interviewed outside on the way to court. He was basically vlogging the entire trial of his life. That's Gabby. Gabby, Gabby coming through. He's the address. We know that voice. Uh, you know who that is in the background, huh? French Montana truly is a day one. Oh, yo, Bun B's exactly. calling me back. Shout to Bun B. Bun B just hit a nigga on the phone, told us he could whatever we need, he got it. Shout to Bun B, rest in peace, Pimp C. So, Max B's about to be fighting the trial of his life. He's got the likes of Bun B from UGK calling him up, sending him messages of support. He's got French Montana in the car. And honestly, he looks in quite good spirits in this footage. I've got to say, he seems ready to fight his case. But unfortunately, the way things worked out, it seems like this positive outlook might not have been an indicator of how the case was going to go. So here are some court documents that actually relate to a 2012 appeal of the final decision, but it does break down some of the original details of the case at the start, which we're going to take a look at so we can understand a little bit more specifically what went down. So apparently Max B's on-again, off-again girlfriend, Gina Conway, was an exotic dancer at a Bronx nightclub named Sin City. And apparently one of the victims had an attraction to Conway that precipitated the events that culminated in another victim's homicide. So basically, one of the guys that was finna get robbed caught the eye of Max 
Saxby's on again, off again girlfriend, with the events that unfolded from there leading to another man losing his life. Two of the victims, Alan Plowden and David Taylor, were partners in criminal enterprises that included mortgage, real estate, and credit card fraud. They drove expensive cars around New York. Plowden carried a Louis Vuitton bag containing cash, sometimes as much as $40,000. On September the 19th, 2006, while in the Bronx, Plowden noticed Conway, that's the lady that was involved with Max B, standing across the street. He introduced himself and took her to a bar where they had a drink. Later, he took her to a hotel in New Jersey where he unsuccessfully tried to seduce her. She left the hotel at 4 a.m. and took a taxi to the nightclub where she met Max B and gave him money. Two days later, on September the 21st, a day before the homicide, Plowden phoned that woman, picking her up and taking her shopping in Bergen County. He was carrying the Louis Vuitton bag and during the trip, she phoned Max B to make him jealous, telling him what she was doing. After shopping, she accompanied Plowden to a hotel in Fort Lee. Plowden gave her a key card and during their stay, he opened the designer bag several times to impress her. She thought it contained approximately $50,000 and later that day, he drove her to Manhattan, dropping her off. After dropping her off, he met David Taylor and two prostitutes, spending the night in a club and eventually returning to the Holiday Inn, where he shared a room with one of the women. The other man, Taylor, shared a room in the same hotel with the other woman and before going to bed, Plowden hid all but $1,000 of his cash, as well as his wallet, jewelry and car keys under the plastic liner of a trash can. He hid the remaining $1,000 under his bed's mattress and then went to bed while the lady that he hired was having a shower. The crimes would be committed in that room later that morning. So after Plowden dropped off the woman that was involved with Max B, she took a taxi to a basketball court where she met Max B and his friends at 11 p.m. During the next few hours, she took an ecstasy pill, drank some Henny and told Max B about the money. When he asked her how much, she just said a lot on some 21 Savage shit. So Max B asked her where the guy was and she said he was probably at a club. She also told him where he was staying and Max B phoned Leodam who arrived a few minutes later and spoke with him. Max B told the girl and the guy to take him to the hotel where the target was staying and according to the woman, Max B did not intend to use force but rather intended to steal the money whilst the target was at the club. So they would go their separate ways with the woman and the other man taking a taxi headed towards the Holiday Inn. Max B was in another car and apparently they converged at a gas station where Max B told the woman that if she pulled off the hit, he would love her forever. They would arrive at the Holiday Inn at 4.30 in the morning after mistakenly going to two of the wrong Holiday Inn hotels, but eventually they arrived at the property with the woman apparently spotting the target's car at the hotel, suggesting that he had arrived back at the room. On the way to the room, the man Leodam put on gloves, took duct tape from his pocket and displayed a handgun, with the woman apparently being nervous, not realizing that this violence would be part of the plan. And once they arrived at the room, her key card didn't work and she called the target's cell phone, hearing it ringing, but he didn't answer. So they knocked on the door and the prostitute that was with the target answered, telling them that he was sleeping. They forced their way in and got busy. Once inside, they taped up the hoe that had answered the door, woke up the target, duct taped him up to, including his hands and his eyes, and beginning to search the room. Now, the taped up man would actually tell them that the rest of the money was downstairs in a friend's room, at which point Max B's hitter pointed a gun at his head, forcing him to call the friend. When this other man, Taylor, arrived at the room, he knocked on the door and it was opened by Max B's girl. And when he walked in the door, that hitter pointed the gun in his face, which he reached for, and at this point, the gun went off, shooting him dead in an instant. With the shooter taking the dead man's watch and changing into one of the taped up man's shirts and a suit jacket, telling him they were going to the victim's room and if the money wasn't there, they would come back and kill the man that was left taped up. Now, he managed to free himself and chase after his attackers, punching the woman, but running away when her accomplice pointed the gun at him. Max B's girl and Max B's shooter would then flee in the taxi that took them there, returning to the Sin City nightclub. And according to this, Max's girl would actually call him after this with Max B apparently saying he was sorry about what happened and that he would take care of her. Now, from here, things would get much worse for Max B as it would soon turn out that the Bronx woman, who was his girlfriend, Gina Conway, would plead guilty to manslaughter and armed robbery charges, admitting that she orchestrated the robbery and ultimately getting a whopping 15 years in jail. But to make matters worse, she would actually testify against Max B, apparently in order to avoid a potential life sentence. I mean, 15 years is pretty hefty, but when you compare that to life or what Max B was facing, ain't so bad. She would apparently tell the court that Max B masterminded the robbery that resulted in a murder, suggesting that Max B had even become very jealous of her new relationship with the flashy man she'd met in the club, with an apparent emphasis on the fact that Max B told her before the crime that if she pulled it off, he would love her forever, and after the crime, saying that he was sorry for what happened and that he was going to take care of her. Now, a video still circulates online of Max B walking the plank, essentially walking to accept his sentence, his final day in court. How you feel about it, Salute? I'm ready to go. <laughs> ain't got nothing. It's our turn. It's our turn. After what we did to the girl, Gina Conway. Oh my God. How's Frenchie say? Oh my God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> All 
I gotta tell you, if the lawyer is quoting French Montana before you're going in for the verdict, it's not looking good for you. I don't know about this American History X looking lawyer, but I feel like he's just happy to be spending time with Max B. I'm not so sure he's putting in an all-star performance in the courtroom. In the end, Max B would end up being sentenced to a whopping 75 years in jail, with his co-defendant and stepbrother Kelvin Leardam receiving a life term plus 35 years after jurors accepted that he did fatally shoot the victim. That sentence was handed down all the way back in 2009, and a 2012 appeal by Max B was unsuccessful. In his appeal, he apparently had claimed that the jury had been improperly instructed imposing an excessive sentence and erroneously denying his motion for a judgment of acquittal. Now, the court would deny this appeal, but there would be hope, as in 2019, his sentence would be drastically reduced, all the way down to just 12 years. With this apparently coming after a 2016 report that he had taken a 20-year plea bargain for aggravated manslaughter. Now, I don't completely understand why that was allowed to happen, but if these reports are correct, it's very possible that we might even see Max B released from prison this year in 2022. On the one hand, it it is very surprising to see somebody's sentence cut down all the way from 75 years to 12. But then on the other hand, you do have to wonder, was it really fair for him to have been given 75 years when he wasn't even at the scene of the crime? It does appear that the chain of events that led to a man losing his life was started on the suggestion of Max B. But on the other hand, it does feel like the majority of the moral judgment should be placed on the individual that pulled the trigger in that hotel room, taking a man's life in cold blood. I honestly am not really sure how to feel about Max B being released, but then again, who knows, we might not see him free as soon as we thought. You know that the justice system likes to do people dirty. And there's a lot of incarcerated rappers who have been saying that they're just one year away from being released for years and years and years now. What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments. Do you think Max B should be released? Do you think he will be released? And will it happen this year? Will the wave god return to hip hop and take over the game? Will French Montana finally have his buddy back? And should Jim Jones be scared that his number one op will be back on the streets? Hope you enjoyed that video. Let me know if you want to see more of these breakdowns of classic hip hop cases. These are stories that I don't really know a lot about, so I'm kind of educating myself on them along with you as we go on the side while I'm working on long main channel content. I am working on a main channel video. No, it's been a long ass time. This is literally the longest time I've worked on a single project and this video is probably gonna come in at like three hours or something ridiculous. I'm gonna do, uh, look, it's gonna be good, okay? It's gonna be a fire video, main channel, keep an eye out for it. And once it's done, I'm probably gonna do a few little shorter videos to just like keep things moving. But anyway, love you guys. Thank you so much for the support. Let me know what classic hip hop story you want me to cover on this channel next down in the comments. And until next time, peace out, gang.